to work more hands-on on the um, usegalaxy.eu infrastructure. And we have a few exercises that all of us should be able to do together. However, given that this is a, uh, we have three hours to do that, I'll try to be as streamlined as possible, but bear in mind that all the training material and everything that we'll be discussing today is already available um, through the training, um, the Galaxy Training Network. I'll be showing you those links in, in, uh, when we start with the exercises. So the first part is going to be focused on unsupervised learning, so how to perform clustering using omics data. After a short break, um, we will um, start discussing about classification and regression. Ideally, um, at that point, we'll be working on our basic data. And Venga, so vamos, what, are, what are the main challenges here? Um, depending on how fast we are going to be proceeding up until that point, uh, we have a last, um, I would like to ask, if possible, everyone to please mute themselves, because I think I hear some noise on the background, and that might um, create some problems for the rest of the participants. Um, thank you. So um, moving forward, so given um, how much time we'll have available at that, point, at that time, uh, we have a more practical application for machine learning, essentially recreating uh, one of the uh, published studies in order to do its prediction. And here is sort of create a machine learning model to predict age from, from, uh, from omics data. So that's the, that's the, the, the plan. Um, we'll try to keep a pace that is going to be convenient for everyone, but if, if at any point, please feel free to put any questions you might want um, into the, um, into the um, uh, ECCB uh, workshop website. So before um, I give the floor to, um, to Alireza and the introduction, I'd like to open a poll um, on, the, um, on, the, uh, on the platform. Everyone should be able to see now an active poll, um, which have a few, um, a, a single question, which is how familiar are you with the Galaxy infrastructure? Uh, given that we'll be using this um, exclusively today, uh, it would be nice to have a, a fairly rough idea of, of, of um, what is your um, background in that perspective. So uh, I'll, I'll give a few, a um, couple of minutes for people to sort of uh, fill in the poll. And um, I'll, I'll ask a second question afterwards, which is more specific for the learning part. Also, I do have to apologize for um, always shifting my face from screen to screen. I have a second screen trying to be um, a bit more efficient on what I'm sharing and what I'm seeing. So I'm trying to keep up with multiple screens at the same time. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. I think that roughly half of you have sort of added their um, experience there. Again, the question is how familiar are you with the Galaxy infrastructure? Um, as soon as this is done, I'm going to share the results. Please keep in mind that this is um, anonymous, so I'm not, I'm not going to be able to see who is responding and um, what is the, um, the, this connection. It's mostly for us to be aware of how much of a detailed uh, description we need to have for, for Galaxy. All right, so um, everyone should be able to see the results now. If not, please do let me know. Um, as you can see, um, the vast majority um, are aware, but they are never used um, the Galaxy infrastructure before, which is um, pretty interesting. And it's actually something that um, we can focus even more during um, this three hour workshop today. And uh, there are a few people that, have, that are using it um, even once per month uh, or use it a few times. Uh, but I think the overall consensus here with about two thirds of the people having, um, having provided the context here is that um, 
we need to be a bit more ex, um, to explain a bit more how to actually use the, the Galaxy infrastructure. So I'm going to stop this poll. It's been um, three minutes since I opened it. So I'm going to edit. Thank you everyone for, for indicating that. Um, and I'm going to ask a second question now. Um, this is more about the actual topic, which is how familiar are you with machine learning itself? Um, all right, so uh, what I want you now is again, to provide a rough idea of how familiar you are with machine learning um, for your own work. Again, I'll give you a few minutes for people to vote. I said this is going a bit faster. This is excellent. All right. I see. All right. Let me start sharing the results first of all. Uh, so people can actually see that. Uh, apologies for the ringing in the background. So um, as far as I can tell, again, with about two thirds of the participants having sort of indicated their understanding, um, there is a good enough understanding of, of, of machine learning um, from the majority. We have also a few people who actually are developing their own machine learning algorithms and workflows. So hopefully, um, what you will be able to get from this particular course is how these algorithms and workflows can be um, incorporated or it can be done in the context of the galaxy infrastructure. Uh, but beyond that, um, the, um, the main um, focus of this workshop is going to be introductory machine learning. Um, so this is going to be mostly addressing people um, that replied um, two or three, which is using machine learning, but don't have a clear understanding. So hopefully I will provide some additional context here. Um, and for people who understand the concepts, don't develop their own code. So they, in this case, using Galaxy will provide you with a framework, with an infrastructure that will help you actually do that um, without developing your own code. So another tool in your, um, in your arsenal. So um, I'm going to stop the poll now again. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for providing um, your feedback. Uh, this was quite useful, so I'm going to stop that. And um, so with that, um, I would like to um, give the floor to Ali Reza, who is going to give a brief introduction to, to machine learning and, and Galaxy. So uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Photos. Uh, I want to share my screen first. Oh. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ali Reza Khan Temuri from uh, University of Freiburg, and I'm a member of a Galaxy project. Um, nice to see you in this virtual event. Uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, machine learning and the theory behind, and uh, uh, what are the facilities in Galaxy to using and uh, developing machine learning workflows. Uh, of course, I won't go into the details because we don't have enough time to talk about the details, but I want to give you a general overview of machine learning algorithms. Uh, first, I will start with the basic idea behind the machine learning. What is machine learning, why we are using machine learning and when we are going to apply machine learning algorithms. Uh, some application of machine learning in different uh, area, uh, especially in bioinformatics and uh, variants of machine learning algorithms uh, such as uh, regression classification and clustering that will be covered in this uh, workshop and uh, also machine learning 
uh, in Galaxy. Uh, first, uh, I'm starting with the basic idea behind the machine learning. Uh, in many cases, in many use cases, you have some objects, you have some data, and you are uh, going to make a prediction. For example, you have some uh, gene expression data and you want to uh, predict if, this, if, uh, is the, if the cell is normal or it is tumor, or you have some uh, data from the patient and you want to predict if uh, he or she is a normal person or diabetic person. Uh, there are two uh, approaches to deal with this prediction. First is expert defined or data driven defined. As you can see in this uh, picture, in the expert defined approach, you will build a knowledge base using the past experience. Uh, most of the knowledge are uh, formulated and represent as a rule or maybe frames. And we have different uh, kind of uh, knowledge representation methods. Uh, but in order to use this knowledge for, the, you, for your prediction, you should have inference engine. You should apply some algorithm to reasoning and inference, uh, and you need a user interface. So uh, a non-expert user can make a query and applying this inference engine to the knowledge base uh, we can give him advice. It is a well-known approach for this prediction, and most of the expert systems are uh, based on this uh, model. Uh, but the goal of machine learning is to learn the function, I mean the prediction function, by observing data. We want to learn a function uh, which map the data to the prediction space. And the uh, machine learning algorithms tries to learn this function by using these data. So in machine learning, we can give computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. We will start from data. As you see here, we have two different data. First is a training data. We are using this training data to build and develop our machine learning model. And in the second phase, in the prediction phase, we have a data to apply the learned model and do the prediction. So in machine learning, we have two different phases, the training phase and the prediction phase using this data to build the model and in the prediction, apply the learned model to the unseen data to do the prediction. In machine learning, we are going to study of algorithm that improve their performance at some, some task uh, using some experience. The goal of machine learning is optimize performance criteria using some examples. These examples can be a expertise or the knowledge you gather or data or your past data. And the learning algorithms try to optimize a performance criteria. And we are going to study the algorithms that doing these optimization in an algorithmic and systematic way. And the goal is improving the performance measure. Uh, there is a key question here, why we are going to learn this function instead of just implementing them? Because in most of the complex problem and uh, uh, big data challenges, we can't write uh, on the functions by our hand or just uh, guess it or just uh, predict the function. That's why we use this algorithm in order to learn and find the parameter and tune the parameters and also choose the best function to do this prediction. And it is not possible for us to just uh, uh, implement this function by hand. 
Why we use machine learning? As you know, uh, for example, in bioinformatics, because of the rapid advances in data collection and the sequencing uh, technology, we can gather a bunch of uh, information, bunch of data from the patients, uh, from the cells, uh, genomic data, <laughs> metallic data, and uh, we have a, a collection of this uh, store, uh, storage uh, in uh, biomedicine and bioinformatic data and extracting useful knowledge among these massive data sets is really challengeable and we can't use traditional techniques uh, such as inference techniques or reasoning techniques or rules and logics in order to extract meaningful and useful information and knowledge from data. That's why in recent uh, and last decade, because of the progress in algorithms and uh, also the uh, theory behind this algorithm and computational uh, resources and uh, powerful uh, um, processing in computers, we can apply different methods for, uh, uh, as, as an optimization methods to extract this useful information among these uh, huge data sets. When we are uh, using machine learning, sometimes we are going to solve complex problems. Complex problems means we have huge amount of data uh, and in most of the cases we have high dimensional data. Imagine in a gene expression data you have a dimension more than 30,000 features and we know a little theory and we don't know the exact theory behind of this huge amount of data. So using machine learning is very useful in these cases because uh, we can't uh, uh, formulate our theory and our knowledge as a rule, as a simple uh, mechanism or simple algorithm to solve this problem. Sometimes we are going to generalize to new contexts and uh, maybe we want to uh, increase our accuracy. And uh, also mm, in most of the cases, we have uh, uncertainty, uncertainty behind the data and also uncertainty behind the theory. Uh, because most of our data mm, may be noisy and we have missing data, and also we don't know the exact relationship between your assumption and conclusion. So uh, handling this uncertainty is possible if you use machine learning. And also in high, through, high throughput data modeling, when you have huge amount of data and the high dimension machine learning approaches can work very good. Uh, there are different applications for machine learning in different areas, such as computer vision for image recognition in natural language processing. When you want to extract useful knowledge among some texts, you should uh, apply machine learning in uh, natural language processing, in speech processing for speaker recognition, for speech recognition, speech synthesis. Uh, in robotic for uh, robot mapping or uh, uh, finding the best route for the robots. Uh, in game playing for chess and Go, you can apply uh, a state of the art machine learning to compete with the human. And especially in bioinformatics, there are many, many and different areas that you can uh, apply machine learning algorithm, such as uh, protein structure prediction, if you want to uh, predict the structure of prote uh, protein, or if you want to predict uh, the protein function. Uh, if you want to predict drug responses, uh, if you want to uh, find the chemical property of a compound of of or drug, you can build your uh, machine learning model and apply it in your data to learn and then do the prediction. Uh, for gene expression, identification or analysis, splice site detection, 
or if you have uh, some image uh, in cell uh, image of cells or biomedical images you can apply machine learning for image recognition purposes to segmentation or prediction or uh, some other text. This is a classical machine learning workflow. The machine learning workflow starts from raw data. Uh, you have some raw data from, for example, uh, sequence, your sequence machine. Uh, at the first step, we use some pre-processing. Uh, with this pre-processing, you can do, for example, uh, noise reduction methods. And maybe your raw data includes some noise or outliers or missing values. These pre-processing steps uh, can help you to omit the uh, data with the high, uh, uh, with the, if it are outlier, you can discard them or you can uh, impute the uh, missing values in the pre-processing step. And it is very uh, important and useful step when you are start, uh, starting from a raw data and you want to apply uh, machine learning approaches in your use cases. And after pre-processing, you will have clean data. Clean data uh, with the <clears throat> samples and features for the samples. In the second step, we have feature extraction phase. In a feature extraction phase, you find and keep most relevant features among bunch of features and in high dimensional data, maybe you have many features. So feature extraction algorithms can help you to find the most correlated and most useful features among these features. Imagine in a gene expression uh, data, you have uh, each feature can be a, a feature of, uh, expression of each gene and in human gene you have more than uh, 30,000 features uh, but most of these genes are relevant to your case and most are not. We have some algorithmic and uh, machine learning approaches to extract the most uh, meaningful features among the features. After you extract the features you sh should select a model and build your model by learning approaches. And when you build your model, you should apply this model to prediction uh, with, with your test data and evaluate your model and uh, extract some results and uh, visualize the results to compare your results with the others and to decide if the results are significant or not. So as I told you, uh, we need two separate data sets. One we use for training part, we, we call it training data, and one we should keep for evaluating our approach as a test part. Uh, so data sets is placed to two different parts, and as you will see in the hands-on sessions, uh, we will have different data sets for learning and also for evaluating. Uh, <clears throat> there are three categories for machine learning variants. Uh, first category is supervised algorithm. In supervised algorithm, you are learning with the label training. For example, you want to classify your emails uh, to two uh, classes, A spam, or non-spam or normal emails. So you have some emails that they labeled as a spam and non-spam. Classification is a, a one example of supervised learning and also the regression. The other category uh, in machine learning algorithms is unsupervised algorithm. In unsupervised algorithm, you don't have any label for your training data, and you are going to discover patterns in these unlabeled un data sets. 
uh, one of the mm, important uh, algorithm in unsupervised are uh, clustering algorithms and also dimension reduction algorithms. Uh, in clustering algorithm, you are going to cluster some similar documents based on a text or for example, in single cell data analysis, you want to cluster your cells in different categories. We don't know any uh, label about these uh, cells. The third uh, category of machine learning algorithm that we don't uh, talk about in this workshop, I just mentioned, it is reinforcement learning. And in this category, uh, we are uh, the algorithms learn to act based on a feedback and the reward of the uh, act and try to improve the act uh, using this feedback algorithm. Mm, it's very useful to uh, computer games, uh, maybe in play Go and based on the feedback, uh, and uh, the feedback can be win or loss. We can uh, uh, we can learn the best act, and it is reinforcement learning. Uh, as I told you in this uh, uh, workshop, we will cover unsupervised and supervised. Uh, in supervised, we will talk about regression and classification, and in unsupervised, we will talk about uh, clustering. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, these three kind of algorithms. Uh, in regression, for example, we want to predict uh, a house price. How much should you sell your house for? To answer this question, you need a data set. These data sets uh, include houses, the feature of houses and the price for each house. So you want to learn a relationship between these features for simplicity. Uh, we can assume the house price or only depend on one feature, it is a size. So you want to learn a relationship between this feature size and the price. And when you build this regression model, you can predict the price for your house using this function. Of course, the predicted value is a continuous in our example. So in the regression uh, algorithms, we are talking about a continuous prediction for the values and using this uh, uh, relationship that we call regression algorithm. The second category is classification. <clears throat> you have some images and you want to know, is it cat or dog? You have a data set from cat and dogs and extract the features. You can see the features and samples in the feature space. And you want to learn a relationship between these features and the class label. And you want to find this boundary line between two classes. So the purpose of classification is finding this boundary line. And if you find this boundary line, you can predict your, the category of your unseen data. If you give an unseen image, you can uh, decide if it is blind to first class or second class using this boundary line. The third category of algorithm is clustering algorithm. For example, you want to segment an image. How to segment an image? You don't have any uh, label for each of these uh, pixels and samples. So you have an input of raw pixels. You want to separate into sets and uh, how uh, clustering algorithms can divide these samples into different clusters and what are the criteria for the best dividing. And after you divide them, you can uh, output a, a 
segmented image here or, or different cluster in your use case. So these two regress uh, three regression uh, classification and clustering algorithm will be talk in more details in next. But don't forget, you still need your domain expertise. Of course, machine learning can do some tasks automatically and it is more automatically in Galaxy because you don't need to uh, build your own code, but uh, still we need your expertise to, in your uh, task defining, in your terminology and for evaluation matrices. You need some matrices to evaluate your uh, results. And uh, in supervised learning, you need to annotate the training and testing data because we need this label data. And also for feature designing, which feature will you extract from the object and uh, in feature selection or uh, in feature uh, um, engineering, which features mostly relevant, relevant with your task and uh, it is based on your expertise. And also after you evaluate the results, you should analyze the errors uh, and uh, decide if it is acceptable and how we can improve our models and so on. So don't forget, we still need the experts. Uh, goal of this workshop is uh, we have data in different cases and we want to build machine learning model and the question is which models are already uh, available in Galaxy and how we can train these models, how we can uh, tune the parameters. And also we will talk a little bit about hyperparameter optimization because uh, it can help you so much uh, to tune the best parameters for your models. Uh, in Galaxy, we have uh, this uh, URL and also the workbench ml.usegalaxy.eu. We try to categorize the tools based on a, uh, based on a goal. Uh, there are different uh, available tools for classification, regression, clustering, for model building, for evaluation. And also there are very good uh, tools for visualization and you can see uh, in this workbench this uh, categorized tools and a short description of uh, each of tools and uh, using these tools you can uh, build your workflow uh, in Galaxy your machine learning workflow and there are many benefits behind this workflow because you can rerun this workflow with the other data you can share this workflow with your collaborator or also uh, you can change the parameter of a model and try to rerun it again uh, in your use cases uh, and also recently uh, we have some uh, deep learning this is a state of the art uh, modeling techniques in machine learning. We also have deep learning uh, tools and uh, try to uh, improve it and add uh, new tools, but all, there are already deep learning tools in Galaxy and you can see this paper for more details. Uh, in this paper, we reproduce uh, two or three use cases using deep learning. Uh, and uh, also in GTN Galaxy Training Network, we have some training tutorials in machine learning. Uh, in, it is a use case for edge prediction, basic of machine learning, clustering, classification, and uh, regression. And also we have recently at a, a deep learning in machine learning. It is very introductory uh, training material. And uh, in this uh, workshop, we will cover some of these use cases. Uh, and thanks for your attention. If you have any question, 
uh, I'm here to answer. If not, we will continue the hands-on part with photos. Thanks for your attention. Ali Reza, thanks. Um, that was um, quite useful. So, um, as Ali Reza said, um, if there are any questions, I will encourage you um, to, uh, to go to the CCB uh, portal. There is a live Q&A and discussion forum sections. Um, please feel free to, um, to put your questions there. And um, some of us will try to, to address them um, uh, while, um, while we continue this, this workshop. So um, before uh, we move on to the hands-on, are there any particular questions for Larireza and what he presented so far at this point? I don't see any raised hands and I also don't see any questions popping up. All right, so I'll start sharing my screen now. Okay. Uh, that is a good question. There we go. Um, Aliza, can you stop sharing your screen so I can start sharing mine? Excellent, thanks. Okay, there we go. All right, so, um, so what we did now was basically going through the basics of machine learning um, through Galaxy. So the next step is to, to focus a bit on, on the clustering. Um, just to provide a context, um, although it's not adding too much on, on what Andreza does mention. So um, in, SM, in a nutshell, what clustering is aiming to do is sort of identify like hidden patterns. And the hidden patterns, um, the critical part here is that your data is unlabeled. It can have labels in practical terms, but from the perspective of clustering, these labels are not taken into consideration. So there are two main aspects for, um, two main processes for clustering. One is the hard, um, uh, the hard clustering. In this case, every uh, point, every data entry is assigned to exactly one cluster. Um, so it means that you don't have a participation, if you like, across multiple cases. So a key example of such an algorithm is the k-means clustering. On the other way, on the other hand, you have soft clustering, in which case, instead of like, Lilia's assigning a class, a cluster to its point, um, you sort of identify a probability, a likelihood of a particular data point being in a cluster. So uh, an example of such an algorithm is the expectation maximization algorithm, the EM one. Um, so uh, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that is that for the time being, what we will be exclusively focusing on is going to be the hard clustering. So essentially, how to assign data points to a single cluster. Uh, in, tips, in terms of types of, um, of clustering algorithms, there are again, three different subtypes. The one is the connectivity model. So the connectivity model essentially tries to identify um, what are, um, so what is the representation of your data in a multidimensional space or in, in, in for example, if you have two, um, two features, two different variables, essentially they're talking about the two-dimensional space. The question is, uh, the, the approach that is trying here is, what are the points that are closer to each other so we can actually put them together? So this is the connectivity model. Essentially, it's based on a, the relationships, the relationship of the different um, data points to each other. So the centroid model is similar to the previous one, but instead of checking out the entire, um, um, all data points in relation to each other, essentially you identify what could be the centroid of the clusters and try to identify what are the, what is, uh, what are the closest data points to this one. Because you don't know the clusters from the get-go, this is an, an iterative process, so it essentially tries to identify these centroids, these clusters, by moving them around this multidimensional space and trying to figure out what are the closest points at its, at its time. And the third one 
is um, the density model. So here is similar to the first one, to the connectivity, but instead of assessing how are the, um, where they are close to each other or not, they are trying to figure out what are the areas, the regions of your multimedia space that are dense, that are very packed with data points. And based on that, um, it identifies that this is a cluster. So for all of those different types, we have different algorithms. For example, in the connectivity model, we have the hierarchical clustering, the centroid model, the more characteristic ones, the k-means, and for the density model, the dbscan. All those we're going to be seeing um, in a few minutes. I'm going to skip um, this one. So essentially, if we try to cluster groups <coughs> or data points or whatever, we want to identify what is a distance metric. So the similarity metric, the distance metric. So one way to um, quantify the relationship between different pages. And this is one way of doing that by using a distance metric uh, between two data points. So what I will go right ahead and I'll stop with the slides now. I'm going to go through a clustering um, exercise using Galaxy. The material itself is available on this URL that you see here. I'll show you exactly how you can find this. Um, so if you, if you don't manage to follow the entire thing from beginning to end, all the details, all the instructions are clearly stated in this, um, in this, um, in this page. So I'll start sharing my other screen now. There we go. So um, hopefully everyone is able to see now um, my, um, the Galaxy interface, right? So first of all, if you want to find out about the Galaxy, if you type, um, I'm actually going to paste this um, on, the, um, on the discussion page. Um, so if you go here, I should be able to do that. Yes. So if you go to the ECCB um, page, you should be able now to find, um, uh, to find um, the link to this particular page. If you cannot find, find this, uh, please do, do let me know. It's under the discussion forum. So um, this actually contains, is the high level organization for training material for Galaxy that are being maintained by the worldwide Galaxy community. So um, these are a lot of experts around the world that actually contribute to that. What we are going to be focusing more are under our tutorials on the statistics and machine learning part. So I'm going to click here. And these are the ones that um, Alires I mentioned um, before at the end of his, um, of his um, presentation. And these are the different, um, different exercises. So what we're going to do now is the clustering machine learning one, which is the fourth one. So um, before we start, and given um, the outcome of the poll that I put up earlier, I think it makes sense to start with a bit of introduction to, to the Galaxy interface itself. If I recall, a lot of people are aware somehow of, of Galaxy as itself, but they have not actually used it so far. So um, first of all, this is the interface itself, as you can see here. And again, I'm going to paste this on the discussion um, forum uh, just to have it there for your reference. Um, <clears throat> this is the European instance of Galaxy. So it's usegalaxy.eu, that's the URL. And um, what it does have is a, um, the interface have, has its tools on the um, right hand, uh, left hand side of, of the page. So all those are organized in categories. So every category has a different set of aspects that you can use. And on the right hand side, what you're actually running are put together as part of a history. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually create a new one. So I can click on the plus sign right here. If you can see on the right hand side where it says history, and um, you should be able to click here and create a new history. So right now you should have an interface that looks like mine. Also, um, I should have mentioned this from the get go. Um, I'm actually logged into um, to the uh, Galaxy interface using uh, my, my Elixir account. So um, if you don't have, an, so everyone with an academic credential can, can actually log in here. I think um, using um, your own email, you can create an account from, from um, regardless. If you are located in Europe, you should be able to, and you have an academic account, you should be able to log in also using the Elixir credentials. 
uh, which will lead you to your um, to an AI. Actually, I'm going to show you how this works, uh, mostly to uh, to provide the, the introduction of how this works. So if I I go cling to login or register, this is the interface that pops up. Uh, if you don't have an account, you can go register here. So that was my suggestion. If you are located um, in Europe and you're part of uh, of the Elixir network possibly through your um, institution, if, if, in, even if you're not aware of it, you can click on the Elixir login. It will give you a list of, um, of all different institutions that are sort of linked under that. Uh, I'm actually, this is sort of my previous election, so this is my own institute, my own research center. So if I click on that, it, it pops me to my um, institutional interface, and now I, I'm, I can log in. And um, what you see now is basically what you saw a few minutes ago. Uh, it's the interface itself, but now I'm actually logged in. And um, if, uh, as you said, if I click on new history, it creates this new thing here. Um, just to make sure that everyone is sort of following me, I'm going to pop up a quick poll uh, that are going to be cleaning up and opening up again, mostly to see if everyone is on the same point as I am. So in other words, if you logged into the Galaxy interface, and you see this sort of, um, of, of, of the environment. Um, I have just a few seconds to make sure that everyone is sort of the same page so I can, I can continue without, being, um, without leaving too many people behind. So as far as I can tell, um, most of the people are here. Okay, there are a few people that are sort of trying still. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. Um, you shouldn't worry too much about the poll. I'm mostly interested that you actually managed to get here. Um, the poll is mostly for my side to, um, to see how this, um, how this works. Um, all right, there's actually a question that popped up, uh, which is, um, so the question is, does this mean that researchers outside EU won't have access to the Galaxy instance? This is an excellent question. Um, the short answer is everyone, everyone around the world has access to Galaxy, uh, both Galaxy EU, but it's also, I'm going to type it here, is the usegalaxy.org. So if you click on that, it's actually the, if I recall correctly, the US-based version of, of Galaxy, the US instance of, of the Galaxy. Uh, because I'm located in Europe, um, it's much more efficient for me to go to the European Galaxy. But regardless of where you are located, you, you can create an account on Galaxy um, and, uh, and you can work. If you are located in Europe, you have some extra um, space essentially um, to store um, data onto your particular account if need be. So the short answer again is that researchers throughout the world can access the Galaxy interface and, and run their analysis there. All right, so I'm going to close this one, going back here, sorry. So I'm going to end the poll. Um, <coughs> I'm going to reset it. So I'm going to write it again. So um, this is sort of the interface before I start running stuff. I want you to, I want you to see another option that's here. So possibly if this is the first time you, you log in in Galaxy, you're only going to see this empty. But for people who have tried it using Galaxy before, you can click on this icon here that is like two tabs. And now you can see all the different histories, all the different processes that you've run so far in the past. So at any point you can, by clicking the switch to icon here, I'm switching here, but it doesn't mean that you need to, to do that as well. <clears throat> and um, going back to, to my, um, to my um, main page. You can see that my entire history has been loaded up here, so I can work with that again. I'm clicking again, view all histories. I'm going to switch the new that I just created. So in other words, what I want to highlight here is that at any point, whatever you do can stay, uh, will stay on your Galaxy account and you can um, reuse it, share it, or do whatever you want with that. So just to provide the context. Um, I'm going to put a name for the history. So if I click on the unnamed history, I can type something. And uh, so this is the ML workshop ATCP 2020 live, <clears throat> pressing enter. And now I have a name for the um, workshop. But this is 
empty, I haven't done anything yet. So the first thing to do is to start uh, with some, some data, right? Um, because I want to provide some context into how to work with Galaxy, instead of using a more um, extensive um, omics data set, I'm going to start with a simpler and a more standard data set that is called the Iris data set. It's a flower data set um, which is um, prepared quite some time ago, but it's becoming um, almost the gold standard for training in machine learning. So people who have some experience in machine learning would have definitely <clears throat> seen um, the, uh, the Iris um, data sets uh, so far. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to paste three links on the um, discussion forum. So these are three links um, that are, um, that will allow us to pull this data and put it on, on the Galaxy instance. Um, so hopefully everyone can see those three links. And let me show you how you can actually put those links and uh, load them into, into Galaxy. The same approach can be used with any data set that is relevant and I'm going to show this uh, later as well. So in order to do that, I'm going to um, use this um, icon here called um, upload data one way or another. Um, it gives you this interface and I'm going to um, essentially click on paste fetch data. So I can put URLs here. I'm pasting the links that I've already uh, copied and pasted onto the discussion and I'm going to leave it like that so people can have a few um, seconds to see what I did. So again, to make sure that everyone is on the same page as I am, I'm clicking on the upload icon here. It's on the left hand side top of the page, um, like a disc with an arrow. If you click on that and then you click on paste fetch data, uh, it will give you this interface. I'm going to paste the links here and now I can click on start. So as soon as this is done, and if it's a green area here, it means that it has already been added to, the, to your history. And if you go here, you'll see that these, there are three new um, instances, the three new pieces of information on your history. So every action that you're doing on Galaxy is being saved into your history. Now that it's moved from gray to orange, it means that it's actually running, which is also quite evident from the spinning circle here. It means that Galaxy is now processing this particular command and it's trying to download these particular data sets from, um, from Zenodo in, in our particular instance. Um, because I pasted the entire link and um, the actual name of each particular, so every box here, because these are boxes, if you can see them like that, um, corresponds essentially to a data set, if you like. I'm not sure if there's a different lingo to be used in Galaxy, um, but essentially anything that can be used in consequent steps of your workflow, input or output, is stored as a box here. So now we have three data sets, and by clicking on the I here, you can, if you click it, you actually see um, what the data contains. By clicking on that, you see that it has actually five columns. Um, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and species. So it's essentially four different, five different variables. One of them we know it's sort of um, the type, the label, uh, but these are, are all other metrics. And um, it's also nice to have a more specific name. So I'm going to click on the pencil icon here and I'm going to rename um, the actual data set from this entire URL to something more close one, like iris.csv. I can also go to data types and either do a um, auto detect data type or essentially select what is the appropriate data type that we know already here. Because both of them are sort of automatically detected, I'm going to click save. And now you see that we have an iris.csv. And these two other um, data types, the, the data files, we're going to be using them in a bit. So I'm only going to change the names and um, ensure that everyone is sort of um, more easy to, to follow. So with that, um, we should have three um, data sets into our, um, uh, into our history. 
So the first thing I want to do is I'll try a simple enough algorithm, so it's k-means. In order to do that, I'm going to um, select, I'm going to search here into um, a tools, a numeric clustering. String, there we go. Um, so by doing that, you see that there's so different, a whole set of different tools that somehow contain numeric clustering inside. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to click the first one and it will give us uh, some options on, on what we can do. And there are diff several different ways of, of running that. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to specify what type of input data we are going to have. Uh, because we know already that we have a CSV file, it's a tabular file, I'm going to select tabular format. Um, Actually, I'm going to do this quite fast. No, I'm going to explain slow enough for the first time, and then I'm going to, uh, we might need to wait a few minutes in order to, to this run. So by specifying what is the format of the input data, then we need to specify what is the data that we want to run. And this is sort of what we want. It's the iOS.csv. Um, <clears throat> we want to specify that we want to use k-means. And now, I'm going to click also on the advanced columns and I'm going to um, select here, um, instead of everything, I'm going to select two clusters. All right, so um, let me run this. So you click execute. By doing that, you see that there's going to be a new um, data set defined here. And it means that it's going to be, um, it will start running um, k-means on this particular um, data set. So um, let's have a look. So while I will wait for this to be done, again, I'm going to start um, a poll about um, whether people have reached this particular point. So as you can see, it's still pending. It hasn't started running yet. I see a lot of people are way in the same position as I am. Um, a few more people are still trying to, so I'm going to wait. <clears throat> so while I'm, I'm waiting that, um, right, okay, so everyone's on the same point now. Good, thanks. Right, so for me it's actually starting. But I just realized, and this is an interesting point, there are two numeric clustering uh, aspects here. So this is a, um, and I think this is also a question that came here on the discussion forum. Uh, Soon we delete the last column that data set that contains the actual spaces. Yes, this is absolutely right. And I was trying to figure out also in the first, um, so I, I tried to run this one, the first one, um, but this does not have all the, um, all the columns that we, that all the aspects that we wanted. So here, the second um, tool actually contains um, much more details on how we can run. So I'm actually going to rerun this. Uh, I'm going to select the IRIS CSV again. Now only there's an actual extra option saying um, if, they, if the data set actually contains um, uh, headers or not, in which case we do know that it does contain some clicking yes. Um, now we, we can specify um, which columns to, to do that. And here we can select all, um, uh, we want to uh, select all columns, excluding some columns by header names. And I'm going to specify what is the header name that I'm going to be removing, which is called species. And now for the clustering algorithm again, I'm going to go for k-means and the advanced options. Again, I'm going to go for two clusters. I'm going to leave the rest of the, um, of the um, parameters as they are, and I'm going to rerun um, and um, execute this um, tool as well. So uh, I see everyone has reached this point. Thank you, I'm going to stop this. Um, so um, the problem, the problem. Uh, now it will take a few minutes for this to run. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to prepare for the output. Um, as soon as this, um, the clustering is done, the next thing to be, do, to, to, to be doing is to sort of a, a, a sort of visualization of, 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 of the clustering. 
So to do that, I can do a, a quick scatter plot. So I'm going to type here scatter plot. <coughs> and I'm going to select scatter plot with ggplot2, which is a more um, fancy leg, if you like, uh, way of, 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 of plotting this information. And here I'm going to um, select the output of the second one. So as you can see, my, um, uh, my original run has turned from orange to gray, which means that they encounter a problem and it's, it's trying to rerun uh, as it started. <coughs> it also means that it's quite possible um, that it's not running correctly because I created the problem. So what I'm going to do, um, I did not select the correct program, I mean. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going, oh, excellent. This is giving me another opportunity. I know I'm going from, from back, uh, back and forth, but I, I want also to give you an idea of how this works. So the red instance actually shows that um, uh, the, um, the, the tool has run correctly. So if I click on that, it gives you some information about the error. Uh, more information can be found here. So you can see, but so what I did is I clicked on the actual name of the data set, it popped out. And now there is a bug icon down here, which I, if I click, it gives me more information here of what's going, what's, what's going on. Um, it, it is a bit more technical, uh, especially for people who have no, uh, not a lot of experience uh, in, um, in, in going for code. But um, even for people who don't have a lot of experience in programming, you can always go to the la almost the last point, which gives you a good idea of what's the problem. It here does says that I cannot convert a string to a float. In other words, it's trying to put new numbers to everything. And of course, um, the last column, which is the, um, the class, the species does not, cannot can be converted to, to a number. So it fails. If for any reason you're not sure what the problem might be, or if it was not an actual technical problem, um, you can always report this information back to the Galaxy team. Um, this interface actually gives you the opportunity to provide feedback. And uh, from my experience, the Galaxy team is, is quite efficient in, in, in provide feedback on that. All right, so going back to my scarf. So as you can see, um, the, number, the, the clustering has been done. In order to remember it, I'm going to change this to K means. So what I did is um, K, sorry, K means <coughs> sorry, clustering. I'm going to save it. So now I can always remember this one, what this is. And so if I click on the I icon, you can see what is the, the data here. And um, you can also select uh, which columns uh, you can see um, the entire data set. So this is what the original columns were, plus an extra column which essentially specifies which cluster um, its entry has been assigned to. So going back to my scatter plot, what I'm going to do here, um, I'm going to select the output of k-means. I'm going to select um, two columns to plot. I'm going uh, to select basically randomly the first two columns of my output, which corresponds to the first two features of my data set. Um, I don't even remember. I think it's not like height and, and something else. And I'm going to type here like a plot for my, for my a title for my plot. Uh, it's k means clustering. I can also put titles for um, X and Y. Uh, again, if I, pull, if I recall, this would be the sepal length. And this is the sepal width. And if you go in advanced options, you can uh, put additional information here, um, like using the relative, um, relative point captions. Uh, all right, I'm going to put a big number. Um, the color uh, is going to be <clears throat> multiple groups. Uh, there we go. And the column, so essentially in the multiple groups, I'm going to define that I want to color based on a particular information. And I know that my cluster is basically on my last column, which is the sixth. Um, yeah, I, so what I did is I clicked on, on the k-means and if you scroll a bit down, it shows helpful, helpfully um, the few, first few lines if possible. So I can sp also check 
that um, the last column is the one that I want. I can put like a color scheme to check. So I can go for like shades of red or red to purple, purple to red. Uh, let's go this one. And um, I'm going to execute. So it's going to run a plotting function here and the output should be a cluster, a, a clustering of those two um, of the iris that, so the output of, of k-means. Um, this is running, it should be done in a second. Um, so let's see if there's another question. I don't see another question in the column on the, uh, on the discussion. <clears throat> so it's still running. All right, so um, it is done. I'm going to click on view data now. And um, sort of this is the, the output. As you can see, it has plotted all my um, data across basically two um, clusters. Uh, this is the light yellow one and the orange one. And um, you can see um, on the right hand side sort of a legend. So this is not very fancy um, clustering, of course, um, but before I move on and um, ask a few more pointed questions to this end, uh, let me actually um, check again if everyone has reached this particular point. So again, running um, this part and, and reach this particular point. Uh, I see people are okay with that. Okay. All right. I saw a few people who are still trying to. Okay. Um, and I'm also starting a second poll, which is about the pacing. If I should start going a bit faster or slower, or this is okay with everyone. Um, it will be give me um, some interesting feedback on to how this goes. All right. So there is a question that I cannot find um, scalable with ggplot. All right. So. Um, I'm going back to my tools. So this is, um, again, the Galaxy interface. I go to tools and I typed scatterplot only. That's it. Um, it should give at least the first two instances. There are scatterplot of two numeric columns and the second one is scatterplot of the ggplot, uh, with ggplot2 to be um, exact. And that's the one that we are running. I don't know, and actually let me check that, if um, the scatterplot with ggplot is also available on the... Right, so even if you go to the usegalaxy.org, it's going to be listed there, so it should be fine. Um, so again, what I did, I went to um, um, the search tools, typed scatterplot, it's, it, 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 it went through, um, through all the tools that kind of have scatterplot in their um, in the comments, and this is how it goes. So hopefully, this has been addressed. If not, please um, repaste the question so I, I, uh, we can see how we can we can help with that. All right. So um, I th I see that everyone has reached this point, which is good. Uh, I'm going to stop this poll as well. Um, in terms of pace, uh, I see that everyone is sort of happy with, with this kind of pace and a few people are actually asking me to go a bit, uh, a bit slower. Um, so, um, and also a few people, so uh, actually let me share this so everyone can see what's the expectation given this distribution. I think my reaction would be to go with this particular pacing. Um, and I will ask again in, in a few minutes and see if I can sort of start, uh, start going faster or slower. So what we did so far is applying k-means. It's not a fancy algorithm and it was not obviously the best solution because already uh, if we look at the iris data set or if you've already seen the iris set in the past, <coughs> you see that there are three species, Setosa, Versicolor and Virginica. Those three, so essentially what we would have liked to do is to create, uh, to essentially come up with three clusters. So we can make this assignment between uh, species and, 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 and clusters from, um, as some insights from that. 
Um, however, k-means, as it works, has to define, we as users have to define what number of classes we want to do. And if you recall, and again, I'm going to the um, very cool. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Meric clustering. There we go. All right. So when we did that in the advanced options, uh, we predefined um, these to have um, to have only two clusters. So this essentially we 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 specified that this is what we need to do. Usually, if we want to identify what is the optimal number of clusters, and we try to do this using what it's called the elbow method. In other words, we use a particular metric. One could be the within sum of squares. In other words, we calculate what is the distance between the different um, points of the same cluster, and we calculate what is the sum of squares, and we want this to be um, as small as possible within um, every cluster. So by doing that, uh, we can identify and running this for multiple k numbers, we can find out um, what is the optimal number um, of k in this particular instance. However, bear in mind, well, that especially if we're talking about k means, the more um, the number of clusters, the more, class, the, the more clusters you put together, you, you ask, um, the lower the score will be. So essentially, it's also always going to be a descending function. So identifying the optimal in quotation marks K is essentially up to the expert to identify what is the reasonable, the most reasonable um, K, um, depending on how, how long or how steep um, the curve of the within sum of, um, sum of the cluster um, is corresponding to, to the rest of the clustering. So with that, I'm going to use the second algorithm, which is the hierarchical clustering. Again, I'm going to use the exact same um, tool. So again, numeric clustering. Um, if you can see, there are two types here. So there is the numeric one up here. Please note that there is numeric clustering Galaxy version 0 0.9. Do not use this one. Actually, let me paste this on, on the discussion as well. Um, do not use, all right, so hopefully this is um, as a reminder. Uh, the second one specifies that it's numeric class in Galaxy version 1.081, which is the more, um, if you like, efficient um, work. So here we're going to use the exact same process we want to specify what is the type of data we want. It's tabular. I'm going to specify the iris set again. We do know that we have, we have headers. And again, I'm going to select all columns, excluding the one that it has a species. So I'm going to type species here. <coughs> and now in terms of clustering, I'm going to select hierarchical agglomerative clustering, which is the most commonly used process for hierarchical clustering. I'm also going to go with the um, advanced options. Again, I'm going to define uh, the number of classes to be two. And the affinity, which is sort of what is the distance that we're going to be using uh, between one, uh, between the two uh, with these data points, um, with static Euclidean. In terms of linkage, there are several options here. We're going for Word. Essentially, these have been, they are pre-selected ones, uh, but if you want, you can, we can, you can play around with those. So I'm going again to submit that. You see there is a new entry uh, in our history. And while we are waiting for that, I'm also going to create this scatter plot. Um, this is another, um, another neat aspect of Galaxy. Uh, we don't need to wait uh, for the, um, uh, for the tool to, to, to execute. Um, but we can start um, preparing the next one. So I'm going to put scatterplot here. Again, I'm going to select scatterplot with ggplot2. And I'm going to select seven because this is going to be the output that we, we want to happen. Um, again, I'm going to select the first two columns. As a, top, as a title, I'm going to put hierarchical clustering in iris. 
Um, okay, label for X, I think again, it was sepal length and sepal width. And in the advanced options, I'm going to select um, the data points to be uh, of size two. Uh, in multiple groups, I want to select the multiple groups based on column six. Um, and in color here, I'm going to select uh, set two. It's done here, it's sort of discrete colors. It will be a bit more efficient to, to look. Um, and again, I'm going to um, ask this to run. So this is happening here. As you can see, it will wait until the previous step is done. And then it will, it will start the, the next step. So while I'm waiting for that, let me check if there are any questions coming up in the discussion forum. All right, I don't see anything here. Usually the hierarchical clustering, usually traditionally the hierarchical clustering takes a bit more time. But given that this is a rather small data set, it should run um, in a few seconds, so it's not be much of an issue here. <coughs> All right, so while I'm waiting for that, are there any particular questions um, that I should be addressing at this point um, regarding um, how to use those tools um, under Galaxy? All right, I don't see anything popping up straightforward. So what I'm going to do is again, while waiting for the other to finish, I am going to run the third type of clustering. Again, I'm going to go by numeric clustering. There we go. Uh, I'm going to select the second one again. Uh, you can check it by seeing the version. If it's over one, uh, if that's the one you're looking for. Um, same type, I'm going to use again the iris. Iris data set, it does contain the headers. I'm going to select all columns, excluding the one I'm going to type, which is species. And now, in terms of the clustering algorithm, I'm going to select dbscan. So there are a few um, options for dbscan, uh, but I think it will be much more efficient to actually show you how this works. Uh, I'm going to again click execute. So you have another point added here. And um, hmm, you can also see how many tools are being um, run at some point, which is a very neat feature of Galaxy. So also it's important to note um, that both clustering processes are now running concurrently. So Galaxy is um, clever enough to understand the dependencies. So it does not execute point eight uh, because it's going to be relying on the output of 0.7, so it's waiting. But 0.9, it's independent, so you can, you can start already. So while this is run again, I'm going to create also the scatter plot <coughs> with ggplot2 again. Um, here I'm going to select the output of the last one. Uh, you can always refer to the name, to the numbers, if you have not put um, uh, anything else. So I'm going to select all right, so this is actually done faster. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rename first um, this numeric clustering to um, dbscan clustering, so I can remember what I'm actually doing here. Um, if you look at the data, I'm clicking on the I icon here, you can see that it's the exact same structure. So the six uh, is always the assignment of goals, and you can see what are the different assignments. Um, again, I'm going to scatterplot ggplot2. I'm going to select the dbscan output, selecting the first two columns, uh, dbscan clustering for iris, it's going to be my title, sepal length and sepal width. And for advanced options, I'm going to select um, user-defined point options, so I'm going to have a bit larger of, of point. Um, we do want multiple groups and differentiating column would be the six. And in terms of coloring, I'm going to again to go over set two and run again. So hopefully this will run again at the same time. Um, so um, we can compare sort of the, um, of the different 
um, different processes. All right, so okay, this is running as well. So as you can see, and this is actually, as I said earlier, a quite practical point, uh, compared to other algorithms, because hierarchical um, clustering um, requires um, a lot of distance calculation between different points and how they move across um, different levels of the tree, it takes usually uh, more time than other, um, other processes. So the scan plot for the DB scan has been completed. So I'll click on the view data. Uh, it's quite big, so I'm going to open a new tab. So I right click on the view data, open link in a new, in new tab, and this is what I got. <coughs> and actually now you can see that there are three different groups. So DB scan actually created three clusters. So the one is the green one. There are a few points here and there. You have the orange one and you have the blue one in uh, most of the area in, in the center. Um, okay, um, the actual hierarchical crashing has been completed as well. So again, I'm going to click on, um, on the view data here. So this is also a bit more um, specific. It has um, these two um, outputs. Um, six, and, and now it's preparing um, these catapult for this one as well. So we can view that. Um, while we wait, we can, um, we can run the exact same process um, for other, okay, this is done as well. So let's, let's view that. So I'm right clicking on this card plot. And this is the output. Again, you have only two classes because this is what I specified. All right, so um, quick question. Is everyone reached this point? Excellent. And all right, there are a few people who are still trying. All right, so um, there is a question in the chat window. Uh, I see that there are a few people are still waiting, so I'll, I'll wait until everyone is done in the poll. Uh, could we just copy a historical step and apply it to a new data set? So this is an excellent point, and let me show you how this can work. Let's say for argument's sake that we want to rerun k-means, right? So if I click on this, on, this, um, on this data set, I can click on run this job again. So if I click on that, it will pop up um, the entire structure as we had specified before. You see the number of clusters is two. I'm sorry, by default, I think it's usually three, but this is all that we have specified already. You see that it already has species and so forth. <clears throat> so what I can do is I can go back here and select, instead of doing that, I can select circles. Or even better, I can click on multiple data sets. So there's an additional point here. I was planning to show that, but it's, it's an excellent point and thank you for the question. So you can, most of the tools that support this in Galaxy do have this option. So there is a single data set, which is what we've been doing so far. Uh, there's the multiple data sets and there's the collection. Um, I would stop the data collection. I will not go into the data collection one because this requires an additional step that we haven't touched upon. The multiple data sets actually let you select multiple entries from your history and say, okay, I'm going to run this for each and every one of the data set that you have here. There is actually a, a statement here saying that this is essentially a batch mode. I can select rerun k-means with the exact same set, uh, with the exact same parameters, but for circles and moon, which we already have uploaded. <coughs> so by doing that and clicking execute, they're going to be, instead of only one new data set, we have two there is coming up here, each of them is going to be reflecting to the um, corresponding data set. So the two, it actually lets you know that this is running clustering on data two, which is the circles. This is running clustering on data three, which is the moon. <clears throat> so you can rerun um, a particular step of your history at any point and sort of change the, the, the data set. So I hope I've, I've addressed this particular question. Um, if not, please just um, 
put this question again, I'll, 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 I'll try to address it in a better way. So I see from the poll um, that most of the people have done this okay. So um, I think also that we are slightly over the um, over time for the agenda. So what I propose now is that we have a short um, 10 minute break and then we continue on <clears throat> uh, with uh, classification and regression again using Galaxy. And this time around, um, we, will, um, we'll, we will start with a, uh, with a more life science oriented um, data set, uh, which will hopefully be more useful. So I'm going to stop the poll now. Um, and I'm going to paste on the window. So now it should be um, 3 um, CST, 3 p.m. CST. Uh, so we meet back in 10 minutes from now. So I'm going to pass it here on the chat window, on discussion forum, um, break for 10 minutes. Back at uh, <clears throat> All right, so um, short break. I'm going to stop my mic and my video. I'm going to leave my screen open and we can start in, um, in, a, few, um, in a few minutes. In the meantime, sorry, if there are any questions, please feel free to add them either on the discussion forum or on the live Q&A and either me or Elena will, uh, will address them as soon as we come back.
Okay, so um, we are 10 minutes past. Um, so I hope you all had a, oh, right, sorry. Um, we have a few more minutes, sorry. I was too fast. I'll mute myself. Um, I've also put out a, um, a quick poll about the pace, if I should go faster or slower. Uh, so please feel to, um, to indicate that. Um, I'll mute myself and we'll start in a couple of minutes. All right, so <clears throat> let's continue. Um, let's continue with the exercise. So before we start, um, I see that people are generally happy with um, with the pace. <clears throat> Right, so um, just before we move on to the classification and regression, um, just to highlight uh, why those two data sets have failed. So uh, probably if you've already done that, you should be able to click on the bug icon and have a look. Hopefully even um, you, can, you can see at the end uh, that the problem is that there, is, there was no species um, into my data set, which is absolutely normal because the circles, if you look at it, it actually has X and Y. The moon has also X and Y, so it does not actually have a particular label to be used for <clears throat> to exclude in our instance. So we had to define slightly <clears throat> the particle job um, so it can be executed correctly. But regardless of that, another point that Ali Reza um, mentioned in the, in the discussion forum is that there is an option of creating a workflow from the history. So if you go here, um, so if you look at the history, there is a cog, um, there's a cog icon and the cog icon, there are several different options. One of them uh, is to share with other people, if you like. And another thing is to extract a workflow. So if, if you click on that, um, I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but it actually puts out <clears throat> all the different um, items, data sets that your history currently have, indicate also which is run and which is not. And you can select which one will be used um, as input, uh, which one should be included. So I can include this one, I can include um, this one, a scatter plot. Um, this one and this one, but not these two. So essentially, it's a workflow. Um, and if I click now and create a workflow, <coughs> it will give me this particular um, 
uh, environment. So I can click now on edit and it will show me um, this sort of an interface. Uh, let's see if I can slightly make it a bit prettier. So I've zoomed out and I am down. Sorry, it takes a few minutes, a few seconds to respond, so it does not look as, as great as it should. Um, so now you can see, um, let me put it up here, that this entire workflow, this entire data set is now being defined as a workflow. And you can see that you put this as input and so the input is provided as um, input to these three steps, which is basically um, DB scan, K means, and hierarchical clustering, and each of them produces a corresponding scatter plot with Digiplot2. Um, this particular workflow is not the most efficient one because we don't we didn't go into too much detail on how to create a workflow, how to create individual parameters, and so forth. But the point that Alireza is actually making is that any workflow, and I'm going back to I'm going to leave, I'm not going to save any changes, I'm going to go back to my history. Any history that you have can be exported both, can be shared as is, including all data sets with other people that are using Galaxy. So it's a very efficient way of sharing information, sharing computational pipelines with other people. And also it can be exported as a workflow. So other people can rerun the same thing by using their own data if, if, if they want to. Um, so it's, it's quite efficient that way. So um, before I move again to the classification problem, um, I'm going to stop. Um, the poll, I see that people are, um, would like me to start going a bit slower. So I'll try to do that. Um, <clears throat> all right, um, there is a question. As some of us may not be able to sign in Galaxy, the workflow feature is not available, right? Um, well, I think that um, because the workflow is saved in your particular history, um, you need to be signed into Galaxy so that it can be saved. But because I'm not super familiar with the administration of Galaxy and what it entails, I'm more of a user, to be honest. Um, it's quite possible that only as I can provide a more coherent um, response to this particular question. Um, in the meantime, I can continue with the um, uh, with the classification part. So what we're going to do now, we are going to use um, another data set. So I'm going, to, I'm going to use the exact same history. It doesn't matter. We're going to be build, building on top of that. So again, I'm going to click on uploading information, um, but this time around, I'm going to use um, three other data sets, uh, which are more life science oriented. In particular, these are the, um, uh, the breast cancer um, data set. So I've pasted again on the, um, on the discussion forum. Uh, there are three links. Um, and again, I'm going to click on the upload from the URL, paste and fetch data icon down here, paste the links and start. Again, it'll take a few seconds for the things to be uploaded. And as soon as this is done, it will allow us to start working with um, the classification. So the algorithm that we are going to be using in this instance is SVM, which is um, support vector machines. So essentially, what we are going to do, we are going to use um, the training data set. As you can see from the URLs, we have the training data set, the test data set, and the target data set. So what we're going to use is we are going to um, select um, all right, so this is already done. So I'm going to rename them real fast. I'm clicking on the pencil icon, uh, removing the URL and save. Again, icon, removing the URL and save. And this one, I'm going to again, select the whole thing and save. And this is done. All right, so again, I'm going to use the SVM. So what SVM does, it's going to um, use the train data set using the approach that I mentioned, splitting information into train and test. And 
actually, why should I not? I'm going to actually show you in this while I'm talking. So support vector, pressing enter. And then we go. I think that is probably the correct one. No, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. There we go. So um, we click on the one that is called version 1.0.8.2. Um, so in my case, I have three different um, versions of the tool. Uh, at any point, I can click on favorite, and I'm going to be saving all those in my um, in my own history, in my own account as favorite. So I cannot, I don't need to find them um, all the time. Um, but you can always um, sort of check. Again, if you look at the other two instances, you see that the version of Galaxy is 0 0.9. So I'm going directly to the third one that I checked is 1.8. 1.0.8.2. So um, the process of doing that actually has two steps. The first step is actually to train the model. As you can, as you can see, the classification task either is to train a model or to do a prediction. So we need to, to train a model. Um, because we are going to use a rather easy example, we're going to go with linear support vector classification. There are different types of sub SVMs that we can use. <clears throat> As I said, in type, we're going to use um, Tableau Diver because we already know that the data set, I'm going to right click here and see in a different window. And you can see that the um, data set is again, tabular and you can see the different columns as well as the target at the end. <clears throat> so it's tabular data and the training data set is going to called pressed um, weight train. Um, does the header contain headers? The answer is yes. And again, we're going to select all columns excluding the last one. So we're going to exclude um, the last one, which is the um, target. If I call the name again, I'm going to check by clicking on that, not the eye. It shows the first few columns. So if I scroll again, I see that the target is like that. I can actually copy and paste uh, because this is, um, it should be the exact same thing. Um, so this is sort of describing what our, our, our features are going to be used for the model itself. We also need to specify what are going to be our targets. So here we have a second data set, it's called targets, which essentially contains only the, um, uh, the, the, the labels. Again, we can click on the actual data and we can see um, the targets is, is there. I'm going to select everything excluding um, Sorry, not everything. I'm going to select the column by the header name. So again, I'm going to select the one by the name and we are going to use target. <clears throat> so, um, train, all right, we start again. We have the train model, linear support vector classification, the type tabular, the training data set is our train PSV. It does contain headers. And for our features, we select everything but the target. Um, because we does, it, the, the data set does contain the class labels, we select the exact same data set. It does contain headers, and we now select the data by column, and we specify that the names, the classes, are on, on, on the last one. So I'm going to click Execute, and now we have a new instance here. So this is going to create a model for this particular training data set in order for us to see um, whether we are, um, we can create a predictive model based on the particular features. <clears throat> the feature that we are using here, I'm opening this to a new window for people to actually see that. Um, it's the clump thickness, cell size, cell shape, marginal adhesion, epicell, uh, nuclei, chromatin, uh, mitosis, and so forth. So these are, observations that have been probably done um, for the clinical concept, the context. Um, if I recall, the data set itself comes from the UCI repository. So you can, if you want, you can check out different data sets there you can play around with while, uh, while testing this out. So while this is running, um, this is only going to create the model. It's going to train the model. We want after training to sort of see whether it works well. So again, I'm going to select the exact same tool. So support vector machines version 1.8.8.2. 
And instead of training the model, I'm going to create to load a model and predict. Here, I'm going to select the output of this particular step that is running. So support vector machine is linear support vector machine. I'm going to change the name later, but it's for the time being, it's absolutely fine. And now what we're going to be using is what is the, um, the, the what we're going to be testing it. So we're going to use the test um, data set. It does contain he headers. So the answer is yes. And um, the type of prediction, we want to predict the class labels. So that's the, the target here. Uh, if you look at the test data set, you can see that it's the exact same structure, but this time around, um, it does not have um, the class, right? So this is sort of a, a clean um, data set with all the features, but not the class. So I'm going to make this um, to execute. So I'm going to put this on our list. As soon as this is done, it's going to be completed. So this is going to do the prediction, but the last thing uh, could also also be to um, sort of visualize what has happened. So in order to do that, I'm going to ask for Galaxy to do the um, confusion, actually confusion. Uh, let's see, yes, there it is. So if you type confusion, it'll, um, one of the few uh, tools are going to pop out is plot confusion matrix precision recall and rock AUC curves um, of the data. So I'm going to click on that and now it asks, Basically, what is our input data set? In other words, what is the one that we're going to be testing then? And I'm going to use the targets because this is essentially the same with the test, but this time around it actually does contain the true class labels. Um, this one is what is going to be predicted. So this is our model, in other words. Um, so no, sorry, this is the outcome. So these are the predicted labels. So this is the output of 17. Yes, this is correct. And this is the model, again, the one that is being produced right now. So the output of that, um, if I run this, and this will take also a few minutes, you see that it does produce a few outputs. It, it, the interesting part that I haven't mentioned so far is when I submit the execute, it also does produce a few, um, um, a few information about what's going to happen. So first of all, it does say what's going to be used as input which we already have specified, but we can, we also print it back for, for us to, to check against. And also it produces uh, a few outputs and it says that it produces a confusion matrix. That's the first output. Um, the precision recall and F score for, for that. And finally, the, uh, the rock and AUC curves um, as the third output. So as you can see, in addition to, uh, to the prediction that is being sort of staying here, um, there are a, a, a few more points that are being um, put uh, in order for us to, to evaluate what, what happened. So while this is, um, this is running, uh, let me see if there are any questions. <clears throat> it takes a few minutes um, because it's trying to, um, to run everything. Uh, so um, please feel free to add your questions here, either as a live Q&A or in the discussion forum. I see that Alvireza has responded to, uh, to the question that you actually need to log into the Galaxy account in order to create a workflow. So that's the, the, the answer to that. Um, it's not much of a hassle to create an account. So I would definitely encourage everyone here to, to, to actually create one. Um, it's quite efficient and it provides some additional um, advantages as, such as sharing pipelines and, um, and data with, uh, with your collaborators. Um, all right, so this is still running. So uh, first of all, uh, I will ask if everyone has actually reached this point, <clears throat> not necessarily the output, uh, but the fact that it's sort of running SVM and waiting for the four hour the outputs to be, to be done. Um, I see that more, all the people who have responded so far are done but I'll, I'll give it a few more <clears throat> seconds for people to respond. Um, and in the meantime, what I can do, right, so there's a, there's a question here. Do the jobs run on local or on the Galaxy servers? This is an excellent question. And the short answer is that everything is running on the Galaxy servers. <clears throat> and for, um, 
for um, Dune Galaxy EU, actually, let me see if, if it's visible somewhere. I know it should be. Um, most of the resources for galaxy.eu are provided by the Dembi, which is the um, German Elixir node. Uh, so all, well, the majority of the computational analysis is, is, uh, is offered, the computational resources are offered by, by Dembi. Um, <clears throat> For the um, US-based galaxy, I'm not really sure what resources are being used, but in all cases, regardless of where you're located, everything is running on galaxy instances and not on your local machine. So essentially, technically, you can connect to galaxy through your cell phone and run your pipelines from there. I would not recommend that unless you have a big screen on your cell phone and you have excellent latency. But <clears throat> Generally speaking, you don't need to have a lot of computational resources locally to run this. You only need a browser. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> All right, so thank you for the question. Um, oh, there was, there's another question here. What is the quota for a registered user? All right, so I am... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Not really sure I can answer that, but I can click on the account quotas here and it will hopefully give me some more information. So uh, as you can see in my particular instance, um, I'm already using 6% of my quota and I'm already using about 20 gigs. Um, and here I clicked on that. Right, so um, account quotas are generally fixed at, 20, at 250 gigabytes for the main galaxy. I think for Elixir users, this is slightly bigger. I'm not really remembering exactly what is the, um, uh, the higher amount, but it's already, I think, um, large enough. Uh, if you, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it's 250, the short answer. Uh, all right, so hopefully I've addressed that. And in the meantime, all my, um, right, so everyone's response, I'm going to stop that. And uh, okay, thank you for the question. Right, so um, let's see what is the app. So first of all, um, this is the model itself. And because I'm going to um, start forgetting what is what, <coughs> I'm going to rename that to, uh, where it is, to SVM model, SVM, SVM model. All right, um, and here I'm going to change that. So this is basically the prediction. I'm going to change it to SVM predicted labels. <clears throat> All right, so now I can sort of easily see what is coming from where. So the model itself, if we view it, it, down, it downloads everything. So it doesn't really help, but what we can do, we can go for the predicted um, label. So we can view that <coughs> and we can see, um, but for the entire thing, we can have at the end um, what are the corresponding um, outcomes. You can click also on the confusion matrix and now this is more of an image. So this is basically a visual representation of how um, the prediction have been done uh, compared to what is predicted and what is the true class. So we have two classes, the zero and the one. And you can see that um, the ones that have been predicted zero, we have a lot of them. If, if you look at the heat map, the numbers, red corresponds to about 70. Um, and um, for one, so true label is one, this is the row, the column is also one. These are about 20 because, and this is sort of not the same um, color because we have much more classes zero as opposed to classes one. Um, the main diagonal corresponds to the ones that have not been assigned correctly. So in our instance, we have a few instances that have been predicted as class zero, but are actually class one and vice versa. So we have a few class one that have been incorrect predicted as um, class zero. So um, this is the um, confusion matrix, sorry. <clears throat> if you look at the precision and recall an F score, this is this particular plot. And this actually is a, a measurement of how robust um, the prediction um, is closer to one. <coughs> Sorry, closer to one 
is actually what we want to have to do. And you can see that for um, class zero, um, both recall, F-score and precision are very close to one. For class one, um, the situation is slightly um, worse. The recall is almost perfect. It, it's, it's perfect. Uh, but the F-score and the precision are, are, are much slower. All in all, however, bear in mind that this is 90%. So the accuracy, uh, the overall performance of, of, of your model goes around 90%. The final evaluation that you can do is using the rock curves, and you can see that the rock curve is, 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 is quite good. Um, the AUC is one, which is like a, a, perfect, um, a perfect match. Um, but all in all, it's, um, it is a good enough um, indication that our model has worked fairly well, not absolutely great. So in that case, um, precision recall and F-score would be straight lines here. But all in all, our, our model worked, um, worked well. So before I move to regression, um, are there any particular questions um, that need to be addressed? All right, I don't see any coming up. Um, so what we're going to do now I'm going to give you yet another data set to run. Um, so the reason is that, as Alireza said in his introduction, uh, let me paste this first on, um, sorry, on our um, forum page, there you go. So these are three more um, data sets to, to work with. <clears throat> so um, as Alireza said, uh, the um, classification um, works in, in, in the way that we just tried out if your, if your class, if your label is actually a categorical value, so it has, um, it, it has discrete um, string labels, classes, whatever. Um, there are a lot of cases though that um, you might want to predict um, a value. So in this case, we're talking about regression. So we want to predict what the value of a particular process might be based on a model. So it's still classification, but it's more depending on, on predicting what the overall outcome would be. So what I'm going to do again is going to click on upload. Um, uh, let me do a reset, paste and fetch data, and I'm going to paste the three ones. So we are going about body fat information and we have train, test labels, and test. I'm going to start. Um, they are added to history and it will take a few minutes for this to, to be added. So what we're going to do here, while this is sort of um, running, we are going to create a regression, a regression model using a large model called gradient boosting regressor. So basically this relies on an ensemble and tries to find um, different um, um, functions that sort of um, can predict um, your ultimate goal. So this has been loaded for me. Again, I'm going to rename this for me to be easier to see. I'm going to essentially move only the URL part of the name. <coughs> save. <coughs> and save here. Right. So. In order to do that, I'm going to go <clears throat> and select a tool called ensemble, ensemble methods. There you have ensemble methods for classification regression. Again, I'm going to check which version is the latest one. <clears throat> All right, so the first one in this instance is 1082, and this is what we're going to be using. Again, I'm going to paste this in the, um, in the discussion so that people can, can make sure that you have um, the correct one um, in, in, in your list. All right, so. <clears throat> um, I'm going to, uh, I don't see any questions, all right. So I'm going to do training again. It's the same process as before. So we want to train a model. And this one, I'm going to use this gradient boosting classifier. The type of data we're going to is going to be tabular, and um, our train data set is going to be the body fat train PSV. 
uh, we want to do a quick view here. So I'm going to click on the um, data set and we can see that it does contain um, uh, the um, uh, headers. So I'm going to select yes here. And what we're going to do, we are going to select all columns, excluding the ones with the name that we want. So if you scroll at the very end, you see that it says target. I'm going to copy it and put it here. So um, in terms of um, the um, class labels, <clears throat> I'm going to again select the exact same one. So fat train. Again, it does contain headers, but this time around I'm going to select columns by the name. Again, it's going to be target. So um, again, showing what I did, uh, I went to the ensemble methods for classification and regression. Uh, again, the version 1.0.8.2. Uh, I'm going to train the model first. The gradient boosting classifier is a regression method that we are going to be trying now. Uh, tabular data, uh, the training samples data set is the body fat train PSV. It does contain headers and we want to select all the columns excluding the target, the, 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 the aim. And the actual target values are, of course, in the same file. So we're going to put the same one. It does contain hairs, but this time around, we only select the, the last column, or in other words, the column with the name target. So I'm going to execute that, and it's going to create a, a, a list here. So while this is running, I'm going to, again, use the exact same process to do the prediction. I'm clicking on the first one again, if I recall, let me check. Yes, 1.0.8. And this time around, I'm, going to not, I'm not going to train, I'm going to load the model and predict. So here, um, the first one, select what is the model. And this is the one that is being prepared right now. And the um, data that I'm going to try is the test. So this is the one that we want. It does contain headers, we can test that as well. There we go. So we see that it does has headers. So yes, and we want to predict the class label. All right, so we click execute. And the last part is again showing the same process. I'm going to do um, plot actual, let's see, uh, versus predicted, oh, predicted. Let me scroll a bit down if it shows up. There we go. So it's plot actual versus predicted curves um, and residual plots. I think that's the first one. No, uh, let's see the second one. Oh, it's the exact same thing. Fair enough. So I'm going to select the first one. It's the exact same process. So I'm going to select as input data the output of the previous one. So the one that's going to produce here by 25. And um, no. Sorry, the predicted one is the one that's going to be produced. So it's a 25. So this is going to be predicted. So here we want to select what is going to be tested. So this is the labels. So in other words, what we actually know it's the true. So I'm going to click this and execute. So we knew we have a few more here. All right, so, okay. There was a problem here. So let me check what the issue might be. Um, okay. I'm going to click on the bug and scroll to the end, unknown label type continues. All right, I may have missed a parameter here. So let me go back here and rerun and see what I missed. So training model, gradient boosting, tabular data, we need train. It does contain headers, sorry. And we want to exclude everything. And we want targets. Again, the same one, body fat train. It does contain header and track. So let me check if the columns are correct. There's the age rating, me, and the target is correct. Uh, let me see if we have any advanced options that I might have missed. Uh, I am not sure. I, I, I am not sure what I, I kind of missed here. My apologies for this. 
Um, All right, so what I can do uh, in order not to, to, to avoid um, wasting time for that. All right, yes, you're right, actually. <coughs> so there is a point in the chat saying that uh, we should be using a um, regressor, not a classifier, which I thought I did. Um, but obviously this is not the instance. Um, so let me try this again. So the problem here, uh, as um, someone very um, correctly mentioned on the um, discussion forum, is that um, it's trying to run a classifier while I'm asking it to, uh, while I'm providing with, um, yes, you're right. So I'm actually using the classifier instead of using the regressor. My apologies for that. So that was the, uh, the problem here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete all of the above because this is not going to work in any case. And thankfully Galaxy was clever enough to remove that. So my error uh, was that by accident, instead of going for a regressor, I went for the classifier. So it tried to sort of classify with label, which was not possible, uh, hence the error. So again, let me select the, the process here. Uh, it does contain headers. I'm going to use the train. It contains headers, everything excluding um, the target. Yes, let me check that again. Nice cuts, by the way. Uh, I'm going to use the exact same one for the train. It does contain headers, and I'm going to select only calls with that. And um, yes, execute. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'm going to continue again with the exact same things that I sort of skipped before, which is, um, let's go back to ensemble. All right, this is the one, hopefully. Yes, this is the one. Now I'm going to load the model and predict. The model is the one we can produce right now. Um, the one I'm going to use is test. It does contain the headers and I want to predict the class labels. So I'm going to run this as well. And finally, I'm going to <clears throat> plot actual versus predicted. There we go. And now I'm going to select as input the test labels and as output the ones going to be coming from the last one execute and it's going to create the, the more here. All right, um, the actual uh, regression has been done. So um, this is completed and it's going to, um, to run now the rest. Um, so in the meantime, let's see if there are any more questions here. Um, uh, again, I'm going to ask for the poll to see that everyone is sort of the same place. And also as a second question about the pacing. All right, so there are people still um, waiting. So it's, it's a good point, so for me, um, the uh, ensemble methods has um, finished. So if I look on the data itself, it should show me um, the different entries that I put as input. At the end, it should be what is the predict value. And now it's trying to, uh, to run the, um, the prediction aspect. Um, so uh, it is running the different figures. As soon as they are done, I'm going to show them with you. All right, I can repeat the last part again. So um, what we did, so step 29 and 30 for me, the 29 is essentially create the model and 30 is based on the model, trying to 
um, predict what is the final value for a given data set. So this is the testing part. Uh, think of this as the actual use of the model, but in our instance, it's testing because we already know what is the correct outcome of this particular entry. So this is why we, we use this. As soon as we've done that, we want to create some plots. So what I'm going, what I did run is we use the plot actual versus predictive curves. So this is the function. Again, I'm going to paste it on the, um, on the chat so that you can see exactly which is the, the tool that I'm, I'm using. <clears throat> and what it does, it essentially compares to, um, to plot, to two lines, to plots. The one is produced by um, the output of the, um, is the, is the one that provide. So this is essentially our labels. Um, and as you can see, the actual tool says that um, it's, if it's only one, I'm going to select the one that's called target. So essentially, in other words, you expect to have target as our goal. And you also need to compare with your predicted. So this, the 30, um, the data set number 30 is the one that is um, the predicted values for this particular data set that provide this input. So essentially here, it's going to plot the two different lines and it's going to compare the differences between those two lines. Uh, the actual and the one that is being produced. Um, it takes a second, it should be done any minute now. Uh, so we can see what is the typical output. Um, so I see that um, a few people are still waiting to reach this particular point. Uh, in terms of pacing, um, it is fairly okay. I'll try to go even slower if possible. Um, I think, okay, it's actually done. So what I'm going to do at the same time, <clears throat> I'm going to change the names of that so I can, I can remember what I, I, I used here. So the first one here is the radian Gaussian regression model. And this is actually the <clears throat> uh, regression prediction. All right, so I can use um, these names to remember what actually happened. Um, right, so let's see um, the plots. So the first one is the comparison between the actual value and the predicted value. So the blue line is the true values, the one that we provide as the true, as the actual data set, and the, red, the orange one is the predicted. And as you can see, it follows it fairly okay. There are a few points here that is a bit off, like instead of 38, it's almost 48, but for the rest, it's following it um, fairly closer to, uh, fairly close to the, to the actual value. Uh, the other one is the scatter plot that compares um, the two different um, aspects. So you expect um, the, um, the different um, points to lie exactly on the X, Y curve. As you can see, most of them are okay with the exception of this one, which is, as you can see, um, the true value is 38. So the predicted value, as you can see on the bottom, is 47, which is the one that we knew from the previous one that's a bit off. You also can see the root mean square error and the R2, which are fairly okay uh, for this particular problem. And the last one is basically the plot of the residual versus the predicted values. And again, you can see that most of them are on the, on the, on the actual line. The only exception being here, um, the one that was the outlier that we saw also from the, from the third line. So all those can be used um, through Galaxy and you can use them to sort of identify and do prediction both in terms of nominal, nominal slash categorical values using standard classifiers, as well as um, for regression and do uh, numerical predictions. In both cases, uh, the process is exactly the same. So in other words, um, you select your model type, you create your model, you can save it as a data set. So both the gradient posting regression model and the <clears throat> SVM model down here are different models that you can use um, for different 
data sets so that you can save this and reuse it if you come up come um, you, you have data that is coming later and that can fit this particular model so it's the same structure and, and then at any point you can use the load model and predict um, function of, of the same structure um, to do the prediction either for regression or for classification um, all right, so I see that everyone has reached this point. Almost everyone in place, so I'm going to end this. <coughs> and um, on the so end, the, the pacing aspect. So um, this is basically a very brief introduction on, on how clustering classification and regression works um, for um, in Galaxy. So what we're going to do now, uh, we're going to um, sort of do a more hands-on application um, on the um, on the um, sorry, I, I want to share my slides on an actual um, process that has been um, published. So uh, I'm not going to do a full screen, mostly because um, Going to be much more convenient to do that. So what we're going to do now, we're going to do sort of an age prediction using machine learning. Uh, this is an article published here uh, in Genome Biology uh, a few years ago and essentially they are connect they're using RNA-seq data and DNA methylation data in order to sort of do a prediction of age uh, based on those two um, aspects. So the first one we are going to do we are going to create a user RNA seq data and use Elastic Net as a regression model uh, for the age prediction. And the second one, we're going to use in the same process DNA methylation data to, to do um, the exact same prediction. So, in order to do that, and um, so I'm going to stop sharing that. Uh, the actual uh, tutorial is here. So everything I'm going to be discussing is already listed there. So if you, uh, if you um, don't follow everything or you miss something, feel free to, 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 to start it from there again. <clears throat> so let me start sharing my Galaxy instance again. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you to um, load some more data into, um, into Galaxy. So I'm going to paste them again onto um, the discussion window. And at the same time, I'm going to click on upload, fetch data, paste those four points here and start. <clears throat> so the first one that we are sort of loading uh, called training data normal uh, is our um, RNA-seq data. So this is, um, this is the normalized data, if I recall correctly. And um, it corresponds to um, about 130 um, healthy patients with age from 1 to 94 years old. Um, and the main point, as I said, is to try to see whether we can sort of predict um, the age based on, on, on those data points. In order to do that, <coughs> we are going to use, create a, a whole pipeline. Um, so there is an, this is an additional aspect of, of Galaxy. So I'm going to take it a bit um, slower here uh, in order to, to go for the whole range of machine learning. So my data has been loaded. So I'm going to do a quick editing um, to save that. Or text and save. Come on. Save. And this one, and I'm going to save. And this one, save. And this one, I'm only moving the URLs um, so that it's more easy to, to see what's going on. <clears throat> and it's still dolling. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how we can create a pipeline for machine learning. So there's a tool called Pipeline builder this is the one so this is the first um, tool that you might um, see and what we are going to do we are going to put all right so this is done 
um, we're going to put all the steps um, of, of the whole point. So first of all, we're going to do the pre-processing pre and we want to do a feature selection. Um, if you look at the data, and I'm going to click on view here, um, uh, it's not going to show everything because this is a, a fairly big data set, but you can see the different um, genes and what are the corresponding values at the end. It has a column. Uh, I'm try it slow if I can capture that. So this is 19 years old, for example. So the last column correspond to the age. If you look at the headers, and now it's frozen. Um, if you look at the headers, you're going to see uh, what it corresponds to. Uh, sorry, that was, um, I should not have done that because it sort of froze my interface, but I'm reloading, um, basically I'm refreshing the screen and it should come, um, should come back. So uh, while it's doing that, what we're going to do is using this, um, wait, using the pipeline builder, we're going to create a pre-processing step where we're going to do a feature selection of this um, of all these um, of all these genes. In other words, uh, okay, exit. Sorry about that. Use Galaxy. Find it here. All right, there we go. Excellent. So again, pipeline builder. Um, hopefully, this was also a good enough demonstration showing that if anything goes wrong um, you can always close the history the, the your browser tab or your browser window and you can go back to galaxy and everything works fine um, so pipeline the first thing we're going to do is to feature selection so the feature selection wants to select the best sort of um, uh, features in order for us to do the prediction so I'm going to go with the select K best, um, which is select feature according to the K highest scores. And for the score function, I'm going to use a regression. So a univariate um, linear regression um, test. So this is sort of a pre-processing in order to, to fix out um, the um, feature. So the second one is to do a feature estimator. Here, I'm going to do a linear model and for the linear motor, I'm going to um, go for elastic net. There we go. Um, we can put um, different parameters here, um, but uh, we can set a, a random state equals 42, because you always know that this is the answer to the world and everything. So let's set that. Um, we want to output the parameters for the whole search and we can execute. So I'm going to start, I'm going to describe from the beginning again. So this is the pipeline, um, the pre-processing and the estimate of the predictor. Uh, for the pre-processing, we want to do a feature selection and we want to select the top K features um, based on, 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 on a scoring function. And the scoring function is basically a regression. So we're using univariate linear regression test to sort of highlight what are the most prevalent features. The second step is the estimator itself. We can add more pre-processing steps if you like, but for our instance, for our example, we go for the final estimator, and now we want to create sort of a linear model um, relying on the elastic net estimator class. So we go for linear model and elastic net, and we can put some parameters here. So this is like a seed, and we can start for 42. And we want to output these parameters because we want to optimize them in order to ensure that we got a, a, good, um, a good fit. So every um, pipeline, as you probably are, most of you are already aware, um, I don't see the questions, all right? Um, most of the um, machine learning pipelines have a lot of parameters. So one of the things that we can um, do is to do a parameter, a hyperparameter search in order to find what, are, what is the optimal set of parameters for this particular um, run. So, Actually, Galaxy has a neat feature here that based on the last tool that you've run, it provides a context on what other users tend to use immediately afterwards. So in our case, after the pipeline builder, most of the people go for a high parameter search, which is what we are going to, to be doing now. 
So I'm going to select the high parameter search. I'm going to click on the graph here and it should create, um, it should open the tool right here. If not, I'm going to go through the time, excellent. And this is sort of the hyperparameter search. I'm going to save it here and paste it on the um, discussion window just in case you want to, um, to check it out, uh, to put it manually instead of clicking there. And in order to do that, what we're going to do is um, we want to select a model section. And we have two options here. One is to do a randomized search and one is to do a grid search. So basically the randomized is trying to find, to do a random test across different parameters. A grid search is much more uh, constrained, is a more exhaustive process, but you also need to specify what are your um, parameters. So this is our, our, our grid search. So what we're going to use as a data set is basically um, um, the, uh, the output of the pipeline builder. So it already selected this as correct one. And um, if it's a deep learning model, you can state it as, as such. And now we want to identify what are um, the parameter um, uh, builders here. So here we go to what are the parameters. So basically what are the parameters for this particular machine learning that we want to, to, to estimate. So this is the pipeline. These the 39 data set are the parameters that correspond to that. So these are what we provide as input to the hyperparameter um, optimization tool. And here is, is um, the process where we're going to um, select uh, what we're going to be using. What is the range that we're going to, to be using for that? So the first one, uh, we're going to go with the um, select K best, there we go. And um, our, our list is going to be 10 and I'm going to select um, multiple parameters here. So the second one is going to, so I'm going to click on insert parameters in here. And for the other one, I'm going to select the um, normalize, there we go. And I'm going to select this as um, a, ser a list of true and false. So both normalized and unnormalized. Um, so the list, sorry, instead of 10, I should put both variables. So I'm going to choose, um, of course, these are not numbers that came up to, to the mind directly. It's mostly something that can run fairly fast in the training module. Um, in other cases, this should be a list of parameters that will be defined by the person who actually knows the problem and knows what are the, the best lists, uh, the best options to test against. So normalize false would check both the true and false. Uh, and the third problem we're going to test is about the elastic net alpha. And the options here are going to be 0 0.12341, 0 0.1231, 0 0.121. Uh, so these are the three parameters that we want to optimize against. And if we go for the advanced options for the search, and um, we want to select um, a regression here. All right. And we want to ensure that we are going to do regression for the R2 um, to, um, to fit the best one. And um, for the splitter, we want to have K folds. For a number of splits, we can go for five splits. Uh, you can always see that these are at least two. And we can put, uh, we want to shuffle that and we can do a random, um, a random split and we can put a seed so that people can um, rerun this. Uh, we, we want to, uh, we don't want to raise the fit error if need be. And um, we want to use as input um, tabular data and now we go for the actual um, data set. So we use the normal uh, TSV that we loaded earlier. We, it does contain headers and we want to run everything excluding the header name, which is age. And in order to find the class labels, we use the exact same one. So training data normal, it does contain headers and we select columns by the header names and we go for age. 
And finally, we don't want to hold a portion to exclusive because we already have one and we can run this. So this was a long one, but bear in mind that this sort of creates a, um, a whole process uh, from beginning um, to end. All right. I, <laughs> I see that I've been going a bit fast for the last one. So what I will do is I'm going to re, um, re show, show again um, how this, this works. <coughs> right, so while this is running, I'm going to discuss again what we actually did. <coughs> so the whole point is that in sections 30, in, in data sets 38 and 39, we defined the pipeline. And the pipeline was do a feature selection and um, do a regression for, um, for elastic net. So this is our pipeline. As a pipeline, it contains a lot of different parameters. And we have two options. Oh, option number one is for us to hard code or specify what are the parameters that we want to run and run our model. However, in most cases, what tends to happen is that we do multiple iterations of slightly tweaking a parameter, rerun, have an output, and then test whether our model, our pipeline worked good or not. There is another option which is to do a hyperparameter optimization. In other words, to um, try to automatically scan or randomly scan um, a set of parameters that we consider that are most important. And for those, try to find what is the optimal set of parameters. So what we try to do here, and oh my God, it failed. Um, what we want to do here is to essentially identify what are the optimal parameters for this particular pipeline, 38 and 39, 38 and 39, for this particular um, data set. So this is what we are going to do. Let me do a quick check and see what actually failed. Uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, all right, it's very possible that I did not put correctly the numbers. All right, that might work. So let me, let me rerun this um, with the same parameters and I'm going to check exactly what I did wrong. <clears throat> So these are the numbers 5880, 5890, 5895. All right. Let me check. All right. I, I did not put the correct set of parameters here. All right. Let me run this again. Sorry. And I will continue explaining um, what I actually did. All right. So we run, but I'm not going to run again. I'm just going to explain what I, I, I try to do. So um, the error that I did is, and I'm going to explain now, it's, it's part dependent. So what we want to do again here is to find our optimal set of parameters. And instead of doing it manually, selecting and pointing and putting different parameters by hand, running the model and testing again, um, we want to do this automatically. And we do this by using hyperparameter parameterization. And we have two strategies in order to do that. One is to provide a set of parameters, a space, and for the um, tool to test against all possible combinations of that or do a randomized search. In our case, because we sort of want to make this in a short time frame, we went for the grid search. The second question is, okay, what is the, um, what is the um, pipeline that you want to optimize. So basically what is, what do you want to optimize against? And this is the 38, the one that we put before that we said that we want feature selection and regression using elastic net. So we specify this here. And um, because it's not a deep learning, because it has some additional options, we specify that this is not a deep learning model. 
So after we specify what is our pipeline, now we actually need to specify what are the parameters. And there is a different data set here that only contains the parameters for this particular pipeline. It extracted automatically all the parameters and put them in a file for us to use. And now, after defining that these are sort of what you want to test, we can specifically define what are the parameters and what is the corresponding space that we want to test against. So in this case, we had three parameters. The one is instead of the k-best here, this is the k-best that I should be using, the one at the bottom. So in other words, if you recall, the first step in the pipeline was to select the top um, k uh, best features based on the scoring function. Um, so what is the number of k? And here I specify that k should be 5,880 features or 90 or 95 or 900. So these are the different values that we specified here. The other parameter that I want to try is for normalizing or not. And here is put two options, true or false. And the other parameter is an internal parameter for elastic net, which is called alpha. And here I put three different parameters, 0 0.01, um, 0 0.001, and 0 0.001. So this is sort of defining our search space. As soon as we've done that, the next step is, okay, will you provide me with your search space? Um, do you have a training set that I should sort of train and, and test what are the optimal parameter set? And here is the exact same process that we've done before. We define what is our input data set. And I specify that the training data set normal that we loaded from Zenodo a few, days, a few um, minutes before. Uh, we select all the columns except the age, which is our sort of our target, our regression model to a car target. And we also specify what are our labels. It does contain headers and we specify the age. Um, we don't want to keep a test set as an exclusive data test set because we already have that to try, try against. And we all want to save what is our best estimator as an output. So and this is what we are running. And as you see, um, this is actually um, completed. Uh, let me see, I hope this was a bit more clear. Um, I don't see a question. I see, oh, okay, Ali Reza has commented that yes, all those steps that I described are already listed um, into uh, the training material. So you can rerun, follow, and um, try them um, after the workshop, after this course. And um, essentially, so this is sort of what we try to do. Uh, as soon as this is done, we can sort of visualize um, the output of this, um, of this hyperparameter search by doing a parallel coordinates plot. There we go. And um, here we um, select what is the hyperparameter search that we did before. And um, let's select C4, C5 and C6, which are the three parameters that we asked to, um, to do. And in terms of coloring, we provide the test score. So if I run this, it will actually give me a nice plot of um, how the parameters were executed, uh, were searched against, um, and how they performed. Um, so you can have a visual representation of how this feature space um, investigation um, was, was, was done. Uh, okay, it's running. And um, so this is a sort of process. And let's see the fitted estimator here. So this is the estimator it is running the high common search. All right, so um, this is done. Let me view it. So this should be yeah, as you can see, uh, on the bottom line, you have, you, on, on, as columns, you have the different parameters. You have elastic neck alpha, elastic neck normalize, and select best K. For each of those, you have the different values. So for an alpha, you remember we have 0 0.001, 0 0.001, and 0 0.0001. So these are the three values. That's why you have three lines starting from here. You have true and false for the normalize, and you have the four different values for select best. And you see that um, this process tried all possible combinations. Um, and the final column here corresponds to the mean test score. And you see 
that it actually aimed for the best score um, and selected those parameters that corresponded to that. So this is how this works. Um, if you go to the age prediction using machine learning, this is the one, because I'm mindful that we have only nine minutes to the end. And um, I, I, I would not want to um, stop, stop very abruptly. Um, I see there is a question about the link for the material. So let me paste the link directly here. <clears throat> Um, all right, so going back to here. So this is what we try to do now. We've basically done the RNA seq part. Um, we did the optimization. Um, we can do the comparison with the actual um, paper and we can compare the, the output. And the next part would be to do the exact same process, but with, um, with the um, CPG sites and information data, we have a trained test um, data. Again, we're going to do the data processing pipeline. The pipeline builds the same thing, regressor at this point instead of, of elastic net, hyperparameter optimization. So again, same process before, and we can do the final prediction using the load model and um, the test rows with, uh, with the final plots um, showing here. I'm not going to go through that again because we have nine minutes, it's probably not going to end, but what I can do I can go to my um, to the prove run process, so you can see basically how it, it 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 eventually ends. And I would definitely encourage you to go through this uh, yourself as well. And um, you can see that eventually you have um, a visualization like that for the different parameter sets, and you can have um, the different. Um, the differences uh, for the different, um, sorry, um, for all the different um, processes that are produced. So, all right. Uh, I don't see any of the questions and we have five minutes to the end. So I would like to um, ask or even open the floor if you feel like, um, uh, like, like, like speaking out and to let me know if there are any questions or any additional points that you would like me to go into detail uh, before we close the session. Uh, I think it's going to be closing automatically in about six minutes from now. All right, how, you, how do you validate feature importance? So this is an excellent question and I'm not sure I can address this in like five minutes. Um, the short answer would be, um, you can either have a predefined um, metric that you can measure the importance of features, um, or you can use um, the impact that the features have on the overall predictive value of the model as an indicator of their importance. However, bear in mind that importance is always, um, it has a domain aspect to it. So I may, as, an, as, as a non-expert, for example, I may come up and say that TP53, um, based on my computational approach, is not a good predictor. It's not an important feature for my, for my analysis because it does not have a significant enough impact to the predictive value of my model. But an expert um, might say that, yes, you're right, but I know that this particular gene is quite important um, in, what I'm, we, we, in what the study is all about, so it should be included. So the feature importance is sort of coming from both directions. It, you, you can do the automated process, the computational perspective, either by using um, these um, quantitative aspects or again by assessing the impact of the different features on the model predicted value or the model, on the model efficiency, if you like, to be more general, uh, but also on the actual importance of the feature for the study in, in, in case. I hope I've addressed that. Um, Alireza, if you have any comments or any um, thoughts to share, please feel free to do so, because I feel I'm monopolizing a lot of the discussion here. All 
All right, so there's a follow-up question. So is there a tool in Galaxy to measure impact different features can have on a test set? All right, so the short answer to that is that you can do the hyper permutation optimization and using the, um, the, the, the impact of the pre, um, the pre processing step of the feature selection step only. And then you can see what is the impact of different features there. So it is a kind of hyper permutation optimization here. And this is what we did right now. Um, I am not sure if there are more specific tools to do that. But the, um, an additional answer that I might give here, um, and also keeping in mind that in four minutes, everything will close automatically, is that the Galaxy team, for, first of all, the Galaxy S infrastructure is quite efficient now in adding new tools on the back end, at least as compared to a few years ago, which was a bit more complex in my experience. Um, so if you do have a tool that is doing this efficiently, um, there's, there can always be a request to the Galaxy team to incorporate this into the Galaxy um, um, tool, tool set. Um, so that's, well, that's one answer. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I addressed that correctly. Yes, Alvesa, please. Uh, and, and no, there is not any specific tools for different uh, feature selection to compare different uh, features selection algorithms, but uh, there are also some uh, well-known methods for feature selection and you can apply them in your analysis and uh, after that compare the results by yourself. There is not any specific tools. And um, so, uh, sometimes we use this feature selection when we have less data and high dimensional data uh, in order to train a model better and uh, also sometimes for reduce the learning time and uh, also the testing time it's uh, important uh, but there's not any specific tool to compare them it is uh, about what you expect from your machine learning model excellent thanks Lereza. Um, all right, it appears that the question has been addressed. Right, so um, with two minutes to end, I'd like everyone to, uh, to thank everyone for joining, um, especially Arileza and the Galaxy team for this excellent training material. Again, um, it's freely available. Um, I've put the link um, on, the, uh, on the discussion and um, if, you, if you don't see it, if you type training Galaxy, it will probably be the first link that will pop out. Uh, it was very extensive and very detailed um, with screenshots, information on how to, to move forward with that. Um, um, all right. Okay, there's a more technical question here. Which language does Galaxy use? R and Python parallelly? I cannot claim to know how um, Galaxy works on the back end. What I can answer is that you can add um, tools fairly easy using Py containers on the back end. Um, so basically, any language that can be incorporated into a Py container should work fine. Um, also, fairly recently, and I'm talking about six months before, um, Galaxy has the interactive environments capability, which means that you can run Jupyter Notebooks, RStudio directly within Galaxy, which means that you can have a data set which you can push then into R Studio that is running within Galaxy, run R or Python through Jupyter there, and the output go back into your history. And um, so this is a quite efficient and a very intriguing aspect of Galaxy for me, which I, I look forward to, to investigate more. Uh, but the actual um, backend work, uh, language, I'm not really sure. Right, so um, the session will close in 30 seconds. So again, thanks everyone for joining. I hope this has been useful. And please feel free to reach out um, to either me or Alireza and the Galaxy team, um, or even refer to training material for more information. Uh, we'll be more than happy to, to accommodate that. So thanks everyone and enjoy um, the rest of ECCB, um, the workshops and the talks. Bye all. Bye, thanks.